Hello, everyone. My name is Mustafa Dumbuya. I'm a journalist and also I'm a journalism trainer. And I work with the Journalists for Human Rights Kenyan program, which is called um, Voice for Women and Girls Rights. And I'm the journalism team lead for that um, project. So Journalists for Human Rights is a Canadian media development organization based in Toronto, Canada. And uh, JHR has worked in over 26 countries across the world. And uh, you know, the approach of Journalists for Human Rights in media development is that JHR trains journalists across the different um, places it works to report ethically and professionally on human rights um, issues. At the moment, we are running the Kenyan program, which is a multi-country program, running in Kenya, in Mali, in the Congo, in Jordan, and the Syrian diaspora based in Turkey. And this program is um, this program works with journalists, civil society activists, you know, civil society organizations, governments, and other stakeholders to provide them with the skills and to you know to, to to respond, you know, to respond to issues affecting women and girls. So for journalists, we train journalists to report ethically and professionally on women uh, and girls' issues. And, it's a, and at the same time, we work with government on the side to ensure we push for policy reforms on issues that affect women and girls. And we also do work with CSOs on the other side to also you know, provide them with the skills, the communication skills to communicate their work effectively. But the most important thing that we do in all of this different step, these different partners that we work with is that we try to build bridges. We try to create linkages with, you know, between all our between all our partners, and that includes with, uh, especially CSOs and journalists, because we do realize sometimes that journalists and CSOs might be doing the same thing. They are working towards the same goals, but they are working in silos. So what we do is to um, provide opportunities to network and to work together, and this is what has brought us to also do the same. Um, um, with um, the global media um, um, campaign to end FGM because we realize one, since we work on women and girls issues, one of the key themes that we look at when we work on uh, is uh, female genital uh, mutilation. And FGM and the GMC has subject expertise on this particular theme. And we thought it's important to work together to push towards ending FGM in Kenya. And you know that's, thank you so much. That's in, in essence what uh, we do at Journalists for Human Rights. Thanks a lot, Mustafa. I think I'll just quickly welcome Naima to just uh, uh, give us a small brief on what, we, what GMC has done so far in those countries, and then we we'll kick off with the first session. Naima. Thank you, Jeremiah. Can you hear me? Can you all hear me okay? I hope you can. Yes. Okay, great. Well, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. And thank you for the quick intro, uh, Jeremiah. So I'm one of the co-founders of the Global Media Campaign. It's a campaign that began in 2013 by a group of journalists uh, in London, as Jeremiah mentioned, who recognized the importance of media for advocacy and for change when it comes to ending female genital mutilation. Uh, and Kenya holds a dear place in my heart specifically as it's where Global Media Campaign was first launched and it's where we trained our first cohort of anti-FGM campaigners on how to strategically use media to campaign to eradicate FGM and turning it into a national priority. So since 2015 is when we first joined, in, when we first came to Kenya. Um, this is when this courageous group of people um, from all over Kenya consistently used all forms of media to create safe spaces for community dialogues, hold leaders to account and work with journalists to amplify their work. Eight years later, we've continued to consistently support partners and stakeholders like local journalists, activists, influencers to end FGM in eight countries, as Jeremiah also mentioned using their local knowledge and expertise, uh, which messages that work best, which, which messengers are the most impactful for social norms change in their community. I'd like to thank partners and colleagues at Journalists for Human Rights who are co-facilitating with us uh, tonight. 
And on behalf of Global Media Campaign, we commend your efforts in encouraging journalists to increase their coverage on human rights issues such as FGM and child marriage and other gender-based violence issues. Kenya obviously pledged to be ahead of the curve on the global FGM targets by 2022. And I genuinely believe it's achievable. Uh, so let's this evening, I, I think for me, this evening is about reinforcing this. It's reinforcing this message uh, and this target that uh, President Kenyatta has set and he's I'm, ho I'm hoping that we all of us together collectively work together in in finding ways of attaining that target although I know it's only a year to go but I think Ken is on track in in actually achieving it so and I think that um, hopefully through tonight's discussions we will um, hear about um, we will find ways to continue collaborating as this is the first of many conversations we hope to continue to have uh, with all of you, uh, with JHR, and as Global Media Campaign, I'm just super excited to hear and learn from you all. And greetings from London. That's it from me, Jeremiah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Naima. For now, um, for now anyway. <laughs> for now, yes. Uh, so we'll just go straight to it. Today we'll have uh, three uh, main uh, sessions uh, where we'll be talking about legal frameworks in Kenya, uh, human rights and FGM, and then we'll have a conversation moderated by a campaigner um, and a journalist, just having a QR question and answer session uh, before we uh, bring it to a close. So Mustafa, to you, and uh, we will start off with the FGM and the good frameworks in Kenya. Thank you again, Jerry Maya. And um, I will just um, continue to ride on the piece that you've already started. And uh, just to speak, you know, the, the, the next session is a very important session. It's important because, you know, a female genital mutilation has been considered universally as a violation of, you know, a gross human rights violation that affects women and girls, particularly affecting their health, their health and well-being. Prior to now, before in many other places across the world where FGM is practiced, it's mostly considered to be a private, it's to a private issue. You know, people blame it on culture, it's highly political. In fact, in my country, in Sierra Leone, where I am at the moment, recently, the president of the country, during a town hall you know, interview, the president, when he was asked about his stance on female genital mutilation, he said that it's a political suicide. And basic, essentially what that means is, it's an issue that he's not willing to address. It's an issue that you know, he does not even want to touch because he believes it will affect him politically. So FGM becomes a, politi you know, a political issue, which doesn't have to be. This is you know, behind the fact that Sierra Leone as a country is a signatory to you know, international, inter international and regional instruments that actually discourage the practice of female genital mutilation, primarily being the Maputo Protocol. So while some might still want to hold onto FGM and consider it as, uh, as something they should continue with, it must be stated right from the onset that FGM is a gross human rights violation and it's criminal in most jurisdic in most jurisdictions, including the Kenyan jurisdictions in which um, you know, in, in which context we are having this conversation. While there is someone who can speak more about this topic than I can, and that's my colleague, she is Winnie Sumbua. Winnie will take us through the legal, the legal frameworks, both the, you know, the domestic and international legal frameworks regulating female genital mutilation in Kenya. Importantly, Winnie will also uh, weave into the debate about FGM and human rights. So colleagues all who are in this um, call, this webinar this evening, I would like to welcome Winnie Sumbua to do a presentation on you know, the legal frameworks regulating female genital mutilation in Kenya. Thank you, Winnie, you're welcome. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Mustafa. Um, I think I want to share my screen. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us um, <clears throat> this evening. Uh, you will excuse me if I seem out of breath a bit. 
it's going to happen. Just understand that it's going to happen. So thank you for understanding. Uh, also, um, because the topic that I'm supposed to discuss is essentially a very, under normal circumstances, it's, it's a very heavy topic, which uh, would possibly require us to have almost about two to three hours of discussions. What I'm going to do is just give highlights. And uh, we have a resource pack that has got proper links uh, to uh, information that you can read at your own time. So you can consider this sort of like an introduction to the, to the subject and uh, where there are questions I'm ready and willing to uh, basically give uh, further information on those particular issues. So my discussion is going to be uh, threefold. We're going to look at the legal frameworks uh, from a domestic perspective, then look at the legal frameworks from an international perspective. And then now we will move forward to look at how uh, you know, FGM is linked to human rights, how it constitutes a violation of human rights and uh, what uh, possible redress avenues do exist for victims of uh, uh, female genital mutilation. Now, as Mustafa introduced me, my name is Winnie Stiomboa and I work with uh, Journalists for Human Rights. I'm a gender lead at Journalists for Human Rights and I'm a human rights and policy advocate who has uh, got an extensive uh, experience in Kenya. So I have got both uh, the skills and knowledge on how to, um, you know, uh, redress human rights violations, as well as uh, the knowledge on how to address some of these issues from a policy perspective. So uh, feel free to engage with me on those uh, avenues as we continue with the uh, discussion. So now I would like to share my presentation with you so I can start uh, my screen with you so I can start my presentation. Okay, so um, the legal framework. So as we know, um, FGM is uh, prohibited in this country. We have had conversations about uh, the outlawing of female genital mutilation for so many years and uh, female genital mutilation along with female genital cutting because uh, there are certain factions who want to call it female genital mutilation and others want to call it cutting to sort of baptize it and make it less um, uh, less of a violation as it already is. But uh, the truth is that, um, you know, a female genital mutilation or FGM or FGMC is a, uh, is a criminal offense in, in the country. There are various laws that talk about it. Uh, from a dos domestic perspective, we've got the constitution of Kenya, uh, 2010. We have the prohibition of um, Female Genital Mutilation Act of 2011, which is the primary law that talks about uh, genital mutilation. We have the Children's Act of 2001 and the revision of it in 2016. Also, we have the Protection Against Domestic Violence Act of 2015, the Penal Code, which was amended uh, in 2014 through Article 4, and then we have the national policy on ending female genital mutilation. Uh, that is, uh, you can call it a piece of legislation which is in policy, it's not necessarily law, but it uh, affects the various laws that we have um, enacted to cover our domestic, I mean, to cover the um, you know, prohibition of genital mutilation. In detail, the constitution, for instance, uh, we all know that Kenya has a constitution which was promulgated in 2010. And this constitution is the supreme law of the land. It means that uh, all other laws uh, come after the constitution. And therefore, whatever has been put in this constitution um, supersedes every what is in every other law. So even if we had, for instance, a law in the country which allowed female genital mutilation, and we do have the constitution explicit as it is, then it means that the constitution would take precedence over that particular law. Um, 
So it explicitly prohibits uh, violence. Now, one thing that the constitution does not do is that it does not explicitly talk about female genital mutilation. There's no clause which is particular to FGM, but uh, the constitution prohibits violence against girls and, any, um, in, and it also does prohibit any harmful practices generally. So specifically article 29C, talks about um, the right not to be subjected to any form of violence. So first of all, we have to agree that uh, female genital mutilation is in itself um, a violation, uh, is, is in itself a form of violence because it involves the cutting of um, the outer uh, labia, the minora, the majora uh, of uh, the female's uh, reproductive organ. And in itself, it's considered violence because as Mustafa spoke about it during his introduction, it, um, it does jeopardize the right to health. It jeopardizes uh, the right to do reproductive health. Uh, and also it, um, uh, threat it threatens the life of the victim. So it is said to be a form of violence in itself. Uh, secondly, Article 29F, talks about the right not to be treated or punished in a cruel, inhuman, or degrading manner. The way in which FGM is performed, I wish I had um, videos of pictures. I, I, I wish I had uh, put together a slide with videos and pictures of an actual, uh, you know, uh, what do I call it? organ that has been mutilated in the way uh, FGM uh, happens. And uh, you would be shocked to see what really um, takes place whenever someone is subjected to you know, FGM. So the way in which it's, it's done is what then constitutes the inhuman or degrading manner, the cruelty with, it, with which it's done, even though most of the times it's masked to be a cultural practice. So the fact is, it is a cultural practice which is inhuman, is degrading, and is cruel to the person to whom it's being, um, you know, sub to the person who is being subjected to that particular practice. Article 44, 3 talks about uh, a person not being compelled, I mean, that a person shall not compel another person to perform, observe, or undergo any cultural practice or right. So this again means for the proponents of FGM who talk about it being a cultural practice, that you cannot force anyone to undergo this if they don't feel like they want to take part in it. And we all know majority of times FGM uh, victims are always forced to, go, to undergo it because again, it's said to be a cultural practice. Then Article 53D talks about it protects every child from abuse, neglect, harmful cultural practices, all forms of violence, inhuman treatment and punishment. Here again, we see um, the clause coming to, you know, just um, put again the particular ingredients of FGM into uh, one long sentence that talks about cruel and inhuman treatment of children, which is again protected in Article 53D. Um, then we have, um, again, it's important to note that uh, in Article 53D, this is uh, what we call the effecting uh, clauses of the constitution. So the constitution has got chapter four, which lists all the rights uh, of, of, of people in the country. But then we have the clauses which come on to put in effect uh, the protective measures that should be put in place whenever any of these rights has been uh, uh, violated one way or another. Then we've got the penal code, which is the primary law that uh, so, you know, uh, proposes uh, punishments or sanctions to people who uh, offend the law one way or, an or another. The penal code is a colonial piece of law, which uh, has been amended over time to bring it uh, to, um, to, 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 to make it current or to give it currency with uh, the lives of, of, I mean, with where we are with our lives as Kenyans. And so the penal code was amended in 2014 and the amendment was done on article four, which states that um, it outlaws the deliberate infliction of grievous harm, 
which includes any permanent or serious injury to any external or internal organ, membrane, or sense. I want to believe that that particular um, you know, article is quite self-explanatory. talks about outlawing the deliberate infliction of grievous harm. When you perform FGM on someone, it's a deliberate action. You really want to do it, you know? You want to inflict grievous harm. We talk about it being grievous harm or permanent or serious injury because of the way, again, it's done. Uh, it's, I think it's called infabuation of uh, the entire female you know, genital organ. There are certain parts that um, I'm told, uh, if you look at uh, a female genital organ that has been um, you know, cut and one that hasn't, you can tell the difference. One doesn't look like it's anything. So that in itself is a grievous harm, which translates to a permanent or serious injury to a person's organ or membrane. So the law is very clear there. Then we've got the prohibition of um, FGM Act, which was um, enacted in 2011. It is the primary, or as I said, the principal law on FGM. It criminalizes it regardless the age or status of the girl or the woman. So article two of the FGM Act clearly defines what FGM is. Um, if you, We'll all, um, we'll, we will, as I said, we will give you an information pack which has got this particular uh, document. So when you read through Article 2 of the Act, it clearly defines um, FGM, uh, it, it states what FGM is. Then you've got Article 19 of, of the Act, excuse me, which talks of um, the performance of FGM, including by a medical practitioner. It lists uh, the particular sanctions that um, would uh, be taken against anyone who performs FGM, including uh, medical doctors, because now we have uh, instances where um, people have gotten clever and uh, they no longer perform FGM in the villages. So they take them to particular doctors and mask it as an, an invasive, as a, and as not offensive because it was performed by somebody who knows what they are doing when they're doing this. We also have uh, seen instances where, particularly for um, persons who are living outside of the country but come from communities that practice FGM, who um, uh, either will uh, ship their children back home to, to the country for, uh, for them to undergo FGM because in some jurisdictions it's not allowed, or again, you find that others, the very wealthy in this country, will now take their girls away from the country to other countries where it can be performed by medical practitioners uh, in secrecy. So once this is uh, known, it, it, it comes to be that uh, you can be uh, prosecuted for doing it. So FGM Act, I think, is one of those laws which we call them um, extra laws that will provide for extradition, which means if you commit a crime which is punishable by this law, you can be, if you leave the country, you can be repatriated back to the country and be punished for having committed that particular crime. So Article 19 does talk about the kind of, it prescribes the kind of punishments uh, that would happen if you perform FGM. Article 20 goes on to speak about uh, procuring, aiding, and abetting the practice of FGM, while 21 talks about procuring a person to perform FGM in another country. Again, there it provides uh, for the extradition of people who will be um, procured to go and perform FGM in other countries. Then Article 22 allows, talks about one person allowing the use of their premises for FGM. We have seen uh, situations where people, um, especially in communi some communities, you find that, for example, uh, the father of the home has said that uh, my daughter will not undergo FGM. But because of societal pressure, you find the mother colluding with other women to have the girl undergo FGM. And because it cannot be done within that uh, homestead, I provide my home so that uh, you, know, you can bring your girl to be uh, cut within that premise and your husband would not know about it. So if I give that uh, you know, space for, for that to happen, I am culpable in a, before the law and I will be punished for it. I think the punishment for allowing your, the use of your premises for FGM is three years. 
uh, imprisonment or a fine not less than uh, 200,000 Kenya shillings, which translates to about, um, uh, that should be two, 200 uh, US dollars. No, no, yeah, two, 200 if I'm, no, 20,000, I don't know. I, I can't really work out the, uh, the exchange rate at the moment. Um, then uh, apart from that, also, um, again, the, some of the circumcisers or the cutters have got um, their own special shrines where they, they do this, which are sometimes found in their own homes or own premises. So Article 22, again, does cover that. Then we have Article 23, which talks about the possession of tools and equipment for the purposes of FGM, the particular tools which uh, communities practicing FGM use to perform the act. So if you're found in possession of them, whether you're a female genital cutter or you just carried them on behalf and the police find you with those, you will be punished um, for that particular offense. Then Article 24 talks about the failure to report awareness of FGM to a law enforcement officer, whether the procedure is in progress as already occurs or is planned. Uh, again, you knowing that uh, there was a planned FGM uh, session and not letting the police know, if it is proven that you had that knowledge and you did not report it, again, you're culpable before the law. And then uh, finally, Article 25 talks about the use of derogatory or abusive language against a woman uh, for not having undergone FGM or against a man for marrying or supporting that particular woman. This talks about the stigma or covers the stigma that uh, is heaped upon women who do not um, undergo FGM, a stigma which goes to force some women to even uh, opt to go for FGM so that they can belong. We have had stories of women who have been ostracized from their communities because they refuse to go through FGM. We've got uh, women who have been uh, abused uh, in public because uh, they did not uh, undergo FGM, including even women political aspirants who have been insulted uh, in the media. Media and uh, for the media practitioners we have here who have shown us the clips of these women being abused uh, by um, men in their communities and being told that they're not fit for political office because they did not undergo um, FGM. So it's um, clear through the law that the use of this language or any insulting language against any person is against the law uh, according to the FGM Act. Then we have um, the Children's Act, which was uh, enacted in 2001 and revised in 2006. Article 14 protects children from FGM. Uh, it states that no person shall be subject, shall subject a child to female circumcision, early marriage, or other cultural rights, customs, or traditional practices that are likely to negatively affect the child's life, health, social welfare, dignity, physical, or psychological development. Now, it's, um, it's very clear that a majority of the victims of FGM are children. Uh, FGM usually targets uh, young girls who are just about to hit puberty. So the Children's Act has put in place a law that protects them from being subjected to this. And it does prescribe a punishment for that particular offense. Article 119.1 of the Children's Act, Part H, uh, provides for a child children's court to issue protection orders if the child, being a female, is subjected or is likely to be subjected to female circumcision or early marriage or to customs and practices prejudicial to the child's education and health. So here again, uh, the law provides for courts to protect children in a manner that they can, they can issue orders which protect them from undergoing some of these um, you know, practices which we you know accompany female genital circumcision and female genitals, I mean, female cutting as, uh, you know, as we, we've talked about. Um, also, we have the Protection Against Domestic Violence Act, which was enacted in 2015. This is a very recent law, which comes immediately in, on the heels of the Constitution. So we have uh, the Act defining domestic violence uh, to include FGM. And under Article 19, uh, 1G, it provides that uh, the facility to, that a facility be set up 
to pro for protection orders covering potential victims against engagement or threats to engage in cultural or customary rights or practices that abuse the protected persons. So basically, uh, this act uh, talks about the need for uh, setting up of safe houses, which will protect um, people from uh, domestic violence. And it provides that those safe houses should also include um, people who are potential victims uh, of threats that come along in cultural or customary rights. So that includes children who can be or are running away from uh, undergoing FGM. So under international law, uh, the international law is quite uh, broad. Some of the laws that co cover FGM, uh, sometimes you find that there are domestic laws within the countries where uh, potential FGM victims uh, live. But uh, in international law, and especially laws that protect uh, people's rights, we have got the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. I'm sorry, I wrote it in codes and uh, I didn't give the full name. But in the final slides that you will get, you will find um, you will find the, 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 the full wording along with uh, the particular clauses of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which uh, are, are, you know, talk about the, which protect people from, um, uh, from female genital mutilation. So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is, inter is part of international law that basically um, talks about, it's what we call the International Bill of Rights, uh, which uh, establishes uh, the United Nations, as well as uh, you know, other uh, international organs that protect people's rights. And the Universal Declaration is divided into three parts. So we've got uh, rights that are, called the political rights, then we have social and cultural rights, and it's within the ambit of the social and cultural rights that uh, we have got the right to health, right to culture, religion, um, you know, the, the, all those rights, especially the right to health under the Universal Declaration, the right to, uh, to belong to a cultural grouping, which talk about uh, you know you not being subjected to harm because of those particular rights. And then with the right to health, it protects you from having your health being uh, violated one way or another. So under the UDHR, those clauses uh, do cover FGM. Then we've got the convention on elimination of any violence against uh, women. Uh, again, for this particular instrument, I will also give the full wording. So CEDO is the primary law that uh, talks about the protection of women against any uh, discrimination. Uh, rather, it's uh, the Convention on Elimination of uh, Discrimination Against Women. So CEDO talks about or protects women from any form of discrimination, including harmful practices which uh, you know, are, are targeted at women by the fact that they are women. And FGM is one of those. So uh, it's again covered under that. Then we have the Maputo Protocol. Maputo Protocol is an amendment of the African um, um, Charter on, on Peoples and Human Rights. And uh, the Maputo Protocol again talks about the elimination of discrimination against women in Africa. So this one covers all African countries that are signatory to the African Charter. And that is basically every other African country that is a member of the African Union. And as you know, Kenya is a signatory to that particular charter and is a member of the African Union. So, <clears throat> so the Maputo Protocol again does uh, have clauses that protect our women against uh, domestic, I mean, against uh, violence, which includes uh, FGM. <clears throat> Excuse me, give me one minute to take a breather and um, I'll just, just one minute, I take some water. All right, Winnie, thank you very much. I know we are also um, a little bit short of time. And so as you take a break, um, I'll uh, probably just uh, uh, join uh, my colleagues in uh, just welcoming those who are joining in right now. I know there are people who had challenges in uh, um, joining this webinar. So please uh, send the link that you joined in to your colleagues and they'll be able to uh, join us. Um, we, uh, when uh, Winnie comes back, she'll just summarize 
and uh, we will get all these resources and then we'll go to the next session, which will be um, on human rights and FGM. She's still going to um, moderate this session very quickly and uh, we'll do it with Mustafa. We're just going to talk about how does FGM violate human rights? Uh, what does the law say about voluntary FGM uh, consenting adults? And those are th things that are already covered in the prohibition of the FGM Act 2011. So this is just a brief coverage of everything. And in the long run, you'll be able to access these documents. I believe that we are journalists. So uh, journalists and also as campaigners, we've done producers work. So we'd probably be able to dissect most of this content uh, within our own contexts. As you know, FGM is carried out differently within the different communities that uh, are practicing it in Kenya. So uh, we basically, I think the biggest takeaway that we look at today is that you understand that these policies are, uh, and laws exist and there is a toolkit that you're going to have access to. And in the long run, you'll be able to have access to them and you'll be able to refer to them when you're doing your stories, make them rich and uh, who will go on forward. So Winnie, sorry, if you took a water break. Mustafa, uh, do you want to take over? As Winnie takes some, I'm back. What a, oh, yeah, oh, okay. Winnie, yeah, Winnie is back. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. I'm back. All right. Okay, All thank right. you. Um, so essentially, uh, you've you know given an overview of how we're going to proceed, and yes, uh, the next slides are going to be quite fast because we just want to discuss um these particular uh, issues, the three of them. So. The question then is, how does FGM uh, or female genital cutting violate human rights? Uh, so first of all, it's important to understand that human rights are just basic principles and standards without which we cannot live in dignity. So we say that FGM is harmful because it interferes with your bodily integrity if you're the victim, and it also causes a loss of dignity. So by the mere fact that it is going to interfere with the bodily integrity, uh, with your bodily integrity or cause you to lose dignity, it already has violated you know, basic human rights. Secondly, it interferes with the health of the recipient. If, I mean, I believe conversations have been had about how uh, it happens and um, you know, uh, the, the potential harm to health that is associated with uh, female genital uh, you know, cutting. Also, it does implicate the right to life. This means that in the long run, if you know, for, for those who end up losing their lives because of uh, the health complications associated with uh, FGM, you've already had your right to life taken away as a result of FGM. Again, it leads to low self-esteem, a feeling of worthlessness, both the practice, if it's happened to you, or um, the need for you to go to undergo it, um, you know, the pressure for you to, to, to be subjected to, to, to FGM leads to low self-esteem, uh, to a feeling of worthlessness, reduced social functioning, you know, suicidal uh, attempts and ideas, psychological uh, torture, among other uh, consequences that are associated with uh, your mental health. And this violates your right to health again. It implicates the right to practice cultural life. This means that it interferes with your choice of what kind of cultural life you want to practice. Uh, again, we agree that uh, belonging to professing a culture and practicing it is a good thing, but uh, belonging to, uh, or rather professing and practicing a culture that is harmful to you is, is not right. And that's again is a violation of human rights. Uh, also, there are conversations about uh, the various books have been written about the initial purpose of uh, FGM, which is said to be that it was to enforce a preconceived code against women by men. So this here underscores uh, an intention to dominate women by men, hence discriminate against them, which again is a violation of rights. Also, it uh, was said to be the purpose to enforce uh, matrimonial fidelity against women by men. I'm sure you've had conversation where uh, proponents of FGM say that if you, a woman is not cut, she's going to be loose and therefore it's important for her to be cut so that she can sub submit to her man and her man alone. Uh, that is again a violation of human rights and FGM is thereby seen uh, as a tool of oppression by uh, men over women. Um, 
that's one of the instances, or rather that those are some of the examples of how FGM does uh, violate uh, human rights. Uh, then there's the question of uh, FGM and a consenting adult. So the mere, the, the fact is that um, FGM is a criminal offense, according to the laws that we have seen, the Anti-FGM Act, the Children's Act, the Constitution, and the many other laws that I have talked about there before. So it being a criminal offense means that you cannot consent to it regardless. So there have been uh, conversations that have uh, gone on to say that because I'm already over 18 and I'm able to give consent, I am able to think uprightly and I know that I want it. So it's up to me to go and demand. It is a cultural uh, practice that is uh, harmful and it's already outlawed. So you cannot consent to something that is against the law. And if you do consent to it and uh, it's known that you consented to it, then you are culpable and punished through the law, just as someone who has, uh, you will be charged, uh, just as someone who has uh, pro propagated it against any other person. So consent is not defense. Uh, Article 19.6 of the FGM Act talks about, um, you know, that particular issue. Then we have Article 52. 5D, which I spoke about that uh, issues protection of the youth uh, and other people from harmful cultural practices. So the constitution itself will protect you against you and your consent, because again, it's against the law. There is a proper example uh, that is underscored by the recent case, which was um, uh, decided just the other day. Uh, the anti F it, it's the case that uh, is called the Tatu Kamau versus the AG and others. This was a petition that challenged the constitutionality of the FGM. I've provided a link there, which uh, will take you to the case itself, and you will be able to see the facts that were being considered, the merits and demerits of the arguments that were given both by Dr. Tatu, among other people who were supporting uh, FGM. Uh, being anti or being against the constitution because uh, one of the things that she was talking about was uh, that it the act that is the anti-FGM act expressly forbids a qualified medical practitioner from performing FGM thereby it denies adult women access to the highest attainable standard of health including the right to health care uh, also uh, within this particular petition um, she was also talking about uh, the constitution uh, allowing for the right to belong to a culture under Article 42B. And so uh, one, one of the things that uh, the court said was that uh, you cannot be allowed to perform a culture that harms you. And therefore, the constitution will protect you from that particular culture. Also, in its ruling, the dismissed soul that was given by the court uh, stated that from the medical and anecdotal, anecdotal evidence presented by the respondents, that's everything that was said that was uh, evidence from medics. It was found that uh, limiting this right is reasonable. That is limiting the right to profess a culture that is harmful is reasonable because um, you know the society that we live in should be democratic and based on the dignity of women. So therefore we are protecting that particular uh, you know, dignity of the women who might be subjected to this. Um, then in terms of case law on FGM, this is particular cases that have been placed before the court that have, um, you can say, provided precedence on um, FGM. We've got uh, Magerer versus Republic, whereby uh, the appellant here, this is, this is the, the Magerer uh, person, was convicted for aiding the commission of FGM and also failing to commit, uh, to failing to report the commission of FGM and allowing her premises. You can see she had three counts as I read for you through the act. And she was charged uh, to three years of imprisonment or a fine, I mean, to a fine of 200,000 shillings or three years if she defaulted any. So this particular case, um, uh, this particular case is good because it underscores some of the issues that we talk about whereby we want to talk about our cultures, but then we have the laws of the land, which then must be upheld. And 
through the link that I've provided, you will be able to see that the, uh, this was an appeal and the appellate court, court upheld the sentence that she had to either pay the 200,000 or face the imprisonment. She was unable to pay the 200,000, so she was imprisoned for three years uh, because, um, you know, it was a clear violation of the law as it said. Then we have uh, another case here which highlights um, an instance where someone is prosecuted for performing FGM on two girls. Uh, you can see that she was acquitted on one count. That is a girl who was 16 years of age, but she was sentenced to seven years for the second count of a girl who of two other girls. One was 11 and another was 12 years of age. Her appeal was dismissed on the grounds that FGM on the second girl's girl was involuntary. Now here, there's a bit of a confusion in law because there's an assumption that because the first girl was 16 years, she could have consented to uh, undergoing FGM. And uh, that the reason why the other two, the, the woman has been punished for the other two girls is because it was involuntary. So here we see some, uh, you know, case law that provides challenges to, um, advocates of, of FGM. I think these have been discussed at length by uh, organizations that advocate for an end to FGM and a, con a proper conclusion has been reached, whereby uh, now there's what was agreed on was the need for consistency in following the law as it has been set. In 2012, again, we see someone being found guilty for failing to report FGM and being involved in the practice, and she was sentenced to four years imprisonment. Again, you see another case here where um, I think the last one here wants to, uh, the, the last case that we have highlights uh, uh, the lack of proper investigations, which again, as uh, journalists and also uh, for people like uh, us who are uh, working in the civil society, we can take on as a lesson. Hereby we have someone who was, um, sentenced because uh, she was said to be aware of FGM being committed on her daughter. And uh, this, the arrest was done in an haphazard manner such that she was arrested and quickly uh, sentenced, ar arrested the same day and by end of day, she was already arrest, uh, uh, sentenced and was ready to serve her and she was to begin serving her sentence. But the problem was that there was a short investigation because uh, she was actually not aware and she had just come home quickly after being informed that while she was absent, uh, taking care of a sick father who had just died, her daughter was subjected to FGM by her indoors who uh, were, you know, took advantage of the fact that the mother was away and she had been refusing her daughter to undergo FGM for so long. So what happened is that uh, instead of uh, arresting the right persons, they got time to run away while the wrong person was, you know, um, arrested. But we see the court here quashing the conviction. So you can see that the law is quite fair uh, on people who uh, perform FGM and those who do not. So I think I want to leave it at that. And as I said, we're going to provide you with the slides. We will give you also an info pack that has got more information on this particular um, you know, topic that I've talked about, the human rights bit of it, the legal framework bit of it. And um, so you can be able to interact with it further. And I want to believe Mustafa and uh, Jeremiah that this is just a formative training. We will have more engagements. And during those other engagements, we can have a longer discussion about it. So that is the end of my uh, presentation. And I welcome any questions or comments. I think thanks a lot, uh, Winnie. We will be receiving the questions uh, probably after this session. We are going in, um, so we'll just have a session with uh, Judy and uh, Domtila, as well as um, we'll also have um, another conversation that will also include Jerry. So sorry, with the same conversation. So Jerry and Judy uh, together with uh, Domtila, please turn on your cameras as we start off this session. It's going to be a quick conversation on our experiences um, as journalists, as well as campaigners. Uh, how do you see this campaign and basically how can we collaborate um, to make sure that we work better together? There is also an issue that comes up on safeguarding and there are, uh, there are guidelines as well uh, that you can access uh, from the toolkit we'll share on safeguarding yourself and your sources while covering FGM stories. But starting off, a quick uh, introduction, Dom Tilda. 
uh, is based in West Pokot. A quick word, Domtila, on what you do and um, your experience working with the media before we jump on to uh, Njeri Rugene as well as Judy Kaberia, uh, just on the experiences uh, working with uh, NFTM campaigners as well. Thank you so much. I don't know whether you can hear me well, Jeremiah. Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, good. So, okay, my name is Domtila Chesan. I'm a grassroots uh, media campaigner working in West Pokot County, using media to advocate for the rights of girls and women in my community. I interacted with a media campaign uh, in 2014 when the global media campaign uh, started in Kenya and I have been working with the global media campaign since 2014 uh, until now when I have become like a little uh, journalist or a little, a little uh, expert in terms of uh, on how best to use media to amplify my work um, at the community level. Uh, and this involves uh, the campaigns uh, that are uh, geared towards advocating for the eradication of FGM child marriages, which is still rampant in my community. So I founded IREP Foundation, which is a community-based organization in West Pokot County that I use as a, as a vehicle, as a platform, uh, working with the community and other stakeholders at the community level uh, to advocate for the rights of girls and women in my community. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot, uh, Domtila. Uh, to you, um, Judy, quick introduction. Yes, good, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Judy Caberia. I'm a multiple award-winning journalist. I've won 11 journalistic awards. Most of these awards actually have been reporting on female genital mutilation and basically issues that affect girls and women. I work for uh, Journalists for Human Rights uh, in Kenya as the gender media trainer. And I look forward to engaging with the journalists and the CSOs because I think this is the way forward uh, to resolving issues of FGM as we look at um, 2022. Asante. Asante Sana Judy. And to you, Njeri Ugene, um, quick introduction. Oh, good evening, everyone. My name is Njeri Rugene. I am a journalist of very many years, what in Kenya we call veteran journalist. Um, but uh, I currently work with uh, the Women's Newsroom is uh, an organization that I founded and it basically uh, amplifies the voice of women in the media. We do a lot of mentorship. I am a media trainer, I'm a mentor, and uh, I have worked uh, for many years at the Nation Media Group uh, as an editor in many, in different uh, position. Uh, yes, and I'm, um, a columnist in the Daily Nation. I do a column on gender and development. And once in a while, I also write stories in the Daily Nation on the same. I'm glad. Thank to you. Thanks a lot, Jerry. Um, I would request, and I hope that this is okay with everyone, that we take it quite raw on this one, because I know that campaigners and journalists often um, look for each other and uh, we want to understand each other's perspectives. So while we have this session, I'd request uh, that we be as real and as practical as possible. So um, we start off with uh, Domtila, you've been doing the campaign for quite some time, both on, on mainstream media, uh, you've been to a number of radio stations and TV stations, as well as running mainstream uh, social media campaigns. Um, nationally and internationally. Um, just kickstarting this one, how has your experience be, been working with um, journalists um, while covering stories on FGM and um, also covering the challenges that normally you come through, uh, uh, you, you experience while doing that? So thank you, Jeremiah. Maybe I can begin by saying uh, I only, I got um, in introduced to the use of media in social media uh, to amplify my work. Um, that, like I said, I'm a grassroots activist. So I got involved or I got introduced to media, the use of media in social media uh, as, a, as a tool that I can use to amplify my work on the ground. Because before then, uh, we used to do a lot uh, at the community level, working with the community members, but uh, very few people knew about us or our, about our work. So it was a struggle for us to even uh, reach out to uh, um, a bigger audience to um, not only to educate them about the effects of FGM, but also to notify them that we are doing this kind of work and we need support. So when I got introduced to media, 
uh, and thanks to Global Media Campaign, which was the among the first organizations I can say that uh, identified grassroots campaigners like myself in Kenya, and now that it's also, also grown to other country, countries. But uh, in 20, um, uh, 2014, 2015, we had the first training whereby we were introduced to how we can amplify our work by just using a, a simple platform like Facebook, uh, Twitter, which most of us did not know how to use. We had the phones, we had the gadgets, we had the internet, we had the apps, but we didn't know that you could actually use those platforms to amplify our work. So after going through this training by Global Media Campaign, we were equipped, we were empowered with the power of uh, media, using media as a tool. So from that point, we at least uh, accelerated our campaign and we moved very, very quickly because we were able to reach a bigger number at the community level. And by that time, I remember we had, um, we had two radio stations, which were just lying around at the community level, but we didn't know that we could actually go on radio and talk about FGM. So we became among the first groups to actually start a campaign on radio going on radio and right now we have three radio stations in Pokot, uh, in West Pokot County. So we are actively engaging the radios right now. So like there's no week that will pass without um, any end of GM message on one of the radio stations. It's either radio jingle, something we didn't know about thanks to global media campaign again you know talking about fgm on a daily basis on the promos and then we also have the radio talk shows bringing different voices on the radio of survivors of reformed cutters elders and other people so uh, by the use of radio station we got even more popular i mean campaign became our campaign became more popular uh, at the community level and we were able to reach a wider audience like a bigger uh, bigger group of people and uh, through the same the same same platform we've also been able to interact with the community to understand how best we can uh, tailor our campaign to fit into what is um, expected of us as campaign groups so we've been able to interact directly with the community members something that would have taken us a longer time if we were just moving about carrying out workshops, carrying out trainings, because you can only do maybe one training in a week, but with the radio, you can reach many people in a very short time. So I really uh, want to appreciate the power of radio, the local radio stations. And this is where we use the vernacular language again. So we speak the language, we are respectful of uh, the cultural aspects. So it has worked very well with us. And I want to uh, really, um, I uh, appreciate the fact that the journalists, especially on the radio or at the local radio stations, they have been um, impressed, they've impressed the campaign to end FGM. We have worked in harmony with the journalists and they've always given us um, the platform, but also even guided us on, on how best, you know, what is the right information on, on um, and also on like, you know, what time is best for us to present our our message, so like for us in West Pokot County, the best time to talk about FGM is in the evening. So this uh, knowledge was given to us, was shared uh, with us by the journalists themselves, that the right time to speak to the community is um, from, from eight to nine or from seven to eight, sometimes from nine to 10. That is when everybody's at home, people are back from the field, from the grazing lands. So we've worked very closely with the local uh, journalists uh, from the radio stations. And also they've been able to help us even to develop the radio messages. So, and um, I must say that uh, working with the national media, for example, hasn't been as easy as working with the local media, because uh, of course uh, we are very far away from most of these national media houses. So many a times, unless they notice you themselves, or unless they have an interest in your community, or unless somebody has introduced, has linked you with them, that is when you'll be able to uh, to be given a chance or to be invited to go on a national TV, to go and talk about your story. And it's not uh, easy to get these opportunities. So unless you're doing something unique, like for example, right now, there have been uh, conversations on FGM going on uh, for a long time on also on the national TVs. So people are looking for different angles. And the fact that we are not, we do not have a, um, um, a proper or not a proper but a direct relationship with the journalists. You know, it's like everybody's doing their their work, right? So the fact that we don't have um, a, a a platform where the the two groups, the activists and the and the journalists, are sharing the same kind of um, uh, views on FGM. So 
this becomes a challenge for us to be able to reach out to the to the journalists to ask questions like you know what do i need to do differently so that i can highlight this story that has been uh, cropping up in my community for example in 20 2020 because of covid 19 uh, uh hundreds of girls were cut in west Pokot county so and I, I only had to make a lot of noise on social media this is how i was able to even um influence the the, the national media and also the global media to be able to identify uh to be able to notice that we were struggling at the community level and that is how we were able to attract even the media to come to, to west Pokot and cover the upsurge of fgm that was happening at that time but be, be, um uh why not for social media uh, maybe i wasn't i would not i would not have been able to reach out to this uh, journalist at the national level. So there's a gap. I must say, I'm not saying that they don't want to cover their stories, but there is a gap. And this gap is because we are down there at the community levels and the journalists mes mostly are up there, maybe in Nairobi or in big cities. So, and again, the fact that we don't have a platform where the, the activists and the journalists are sharing information, so that becomes difficult because you need to really uh, come up with a very uh different story or something that, that is that is um juicy for them to be able to notice it or for them to be able to uh, support you with and in most cases it, it also requires resources it does require resources because you want to bring journalists to the county i've seen a, an example where big ngos jeremiah are able to facilitate a media house to come and cover a story that they have been able to fund i cannot do that i don't have the money to do that but it looks like these days, unless you have, unless you have a very, very, uh, di a very unique story that has not been covered before, or you have, a, you have a um, connection with the journalist or the, or the media house, that's when you'll be able to convince them to come and, and highlight that story. And also, unless you have the money, because you need to facilitate this, this group of journalists to come all day from maybe it's KTN or NTV or Citizen to come all day from Nairobi to come and write about you. So activists don't have that kind of money to do that work so we really need support uh, we really need to be guided by the journalist on how best because we've been taught about you know you need to come up with a different angle you need to come up with a different stories so we need this kind of uh, because i know things keep changing over uh, like every single day keeps things keep changing because fgm is an ongoing conversation so we need tips on how best you know how best can we keep improving our messages on fgm so that we are getting at least maximum coverage because with maximum coverage comes support as well with maximum coverage also this is where we are able to even um uh, you know like uh, talk about fgm and even have a proper impact at the community level and also at the government level so and i must say uh, finally about social media campaign this one has become just uh, like the best I must say, this has become the best platform for us as activists because uh, this is where we are. We have free space. We have like almost everything is free for us to to be able to share our work uh, on social media campaign. As much as we need, we require data, but this is a space where we can freely enjoy uh, the space or the platform to interact with our viewers, interact with our supporters, highlight our work. And this has worked for me and my foundation, for example, because I'm able to connect with journalists, I'm able to connect with the community, I'm able to connect with the influencers, I'm able to connect with the policy makers, I'm able to, you know, scream the loudest when there's a problem, I'm able to even appreciate people who are supporting us. So I must say that media and social media has been powerful, powerful for us at the community level. Thank you so much, Dom Tiller. I think uh, we've lost Jeremiah for a second, but um, how, Judy, what about over to you? Um, what, what do you think, how do you think as journalists, you could help campaigners like Dom Tiller to share their stories? What sort of strategies are out there that, you know, that you can maybe share uh, from your experience? And then maybe we'll move over to Injeri. Thank you. Yeah. Um... First, uh, Domitila, I think you've really done an amazing job. Uh, it's not always easy to get uh, journalists to travel, especially to come and cover um, stories, especially when they are far away. But one of the things that I've realized that works for me, especially when I was a daily reporter working on these stories, I would go as far as Marsa Beach, I would go to Narok. Basically, it was fashion in me. So just saying, I would ask you, for example, on NTV, who do you think is the journalist who reports on FGM? 
if you find out who that person is, then call them, try to look for them. Even if you don't have the phone number, you can reach them out on Twitter. So the best thing as a civil society organization is to look at what journalists do. Who is on this beat? Who reports on this beat? When you reach out to journalists uh, directly, they are willing to come. Then another thing that I realized with journalists, and if you invited me and you're inviting everybody, especially if I have to make a lot of sacrifice, I ask, is it worth it for me to travel all the way to Nairobi, for example, to uh, Narok or whichever uh, place? So journalists also want exclusiveness of the story. So if you're inviting someone, sometimes don't run for the quantity, run for quality. Instead of having 20 journalists covering you, you can narrow down and decide, I'll have one from radio, one from TV, one from print, you know, one from community media. That way, someone feels this story, I'm the one with this story. Journalists, good journalists love exclusive stories. And if I have to make the sacrifice of taking three or four days as a journalist, I really want to be, you know, the person to take uh, 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 that big story. Another thing is what kind of relationship do you have with the media? Because um, the thing is, let the relationship be, please, can you come and cover this event? Oh, there's a girl you've rescued. Can you come and cover this story? No, the same way you build relation, the same way you build friendship with the new people that you meet is the same way that you need to establish friendship to the journalists. You know, hi, Judy Caberia, how are you? I have been reading your story. The story that you did is very nice. Or when you have time, can you come and meet and see the work that we do? Really, a good journalist will be able to come, establish that uh, friendship, that relationship. And when you have that strong relationship, the journalist will be your friend in good and in bad times. This is the kind of relationship that you need to have with the media. Yes, some of them really have to be facilitated. But I know journalists actually who the media houses are willing to facilitate, especially when they look at the world of the story. Then as civil society groups, um, sometimes I feel uh, there's like some sort of uh, competition, especially when they're out there. We need sometimes to come together, you know, form uh, uh, huge collaborations. And then I'll be happy as a journalist to say, 15 civil society organizations in Pokot have held a press conference, as opposed today this organization is rescuing somebody, tomorrow another one is launching a strategic plan. So you two ask yourself, what is it that is newsworthy? Like you realize even the perpetrators themselves have changed, you know, the mode of operation, you know? When they move from Kenya to Tanzania, go to the FGM and return the girls here. So it means nobody can do things the way they used to do it before. Whether it's journalists, whether it's a CS, CSOs, we have to move with the times. And again, this is a challenge to the journalists. Are we always doing the stories the same way? Things have really changed and we have to be creative also as journalists. How do we identify good stories? How do we identify the, uh, the unique angles that are going to breathe some freshness is into these tired stories? Because I say FGM is a tired story, but the fact that it's tired does not mean the issues are not there. The issues are there. So how do we tell these issues creatively without boring the audience and at the same time attracting the attention of the people? This question also, this also goes to the CSOs. How do you become creative in how you put your stories how do you package uh, the, 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 uh, the stories when you are inviting the media to cover? So all of us require creativity. For example, if I'm inviting a journalist, I'll give you an example of a story I did with, uh, I think it was World Vision. It was in Narrow County. And this day we left Nairobi at 3 a.m. You can imagine sacrificing that time, 3 a.m., going and coming back the same day. But I told them, when I get there, I don't want to just cover the launch of you launching some program for education. I would like to talk to a victim. I would like to talk to this older man who married a younger girl. I would like to talk to someone who used to circumcise this girl. That way, I was able to have a better story, a unique story, rather than just reporting a launch. If you go to the media house and say we are launching this program, pretty sure a lot of media houses will not put their resources into that. But if you put something that is interesting and attractive for the, for the media, they'll be willing to come and uh, report. And um, again, it's diversifying the sources for the media. For example, is it the CEO of the organization who is always talking, or do we have divergent voices that are bringing this kind of, sort of freshness in the, in the story? So these are some of the things that the media or the journalists really consider. And that way, you can encourage them or you can attract them to continue following up the story. 
Thanks a lot, Judy. Um, I know that maybe in, in media houses, you normally have briefs and people have to have to pitch for stories. Of course, there's a budget that goes into it. So I think those are really good pieces of advice you've given there in terms of what stories are newsworthy, what stories will go on air, and what values are you looking for? Of course, if well, I think one takeaway point for me personally is when you invite uh, 10 media houses uh, to a very far place, then I ask myself, is it really going to, is it really worth it if, if this is going to be covered either way? Um, so I think the targeting part is really important. So um, we don't have much time and these are question and answer session, but before then, for a long time, we've had conversations, well, how should we protect the sources? Uh, first of all, we have the issue of um, campaigners themselves are going to the ground, but also we have, how do we present uh, survivors? So for example, a girl has been cut. Uh, I know within journalism terms, we have uh, people being blurred, uh, their faces being blurred. We also have uh, their names being distorted and their voices as well. Uh, in this case, how should we work um, together as journalists and campaigners to make sure that we are all well protected while doing these stories? And I'd, I'd, I'd probably ask and Jerry Rugene to uh, take us to, through this because I know that um, also in our work, sometimes we risk our lives when going to cover FGM stories where the communities are also violent. Um, thank you very much. And um, Dom, um, Dom Tila, um, I really am impressed about uh, your work and the fact that um, you are actually working hand in hand uh, with journalists. We hardly hear this uh, from, um, from the ground. Uh, but anyway, coming to the issue of, uh, of sources, you know, journalists here know that uh, we usually say that uh, there is no story that is um, worth your life. But there are stories that we have to tell stories. You cannot cow and hide and say you are not going to do stories because you are not going to be protected. We have to say is that, um, like Judy says, we have to change how we are doing things today. We are looking at the Kenya government and from what the president has been saying, you can see there's a lot of commitment that they are going to meet the 2022 target. So um, whether communities uh, become um, communities, individuals or whoever become hostile, these stories have to be told and we have to look for a way of telling them. For instance, why, um, okay, we see, we are looking at data and the government the civil society and everybody else has put in, uh, has invested, we must say that we have invested quite a lot in fighting this uh, retrogressive pro, uh, practice. Why are we not succeeding? So can we go down, do investigative stories? But when you are doing these investigative stories, we know that um, you are likely to get to hostilities. But when you are working in a media house, say for instance, uh, the nation, you know that you are working hand in hand with the media houses, that um, uh, your security, for instance, you have to work with your editors, with everybody else, and know that the security is guaranteed. But at the same time, there ha we have to work with uh, trust that I know as Domtila, and the journalist so and so that uh, you have given me this story. Uh, there's this uh, Carter, there's this person who is so hostile, but you have given me that. I have to do that story uh, knowing that I'm going to protect Domtila. Domtila has also to protect me. And you also have to work hand in hand with the security because today you are told that um, the security, the provincial administration, let me just call them that, they have instructions that, um, uh, oh, let me not use instructions because it sounds like <laughs> it's uh, violent, but they know that uh, we have a target that you have to fight this. So a journalist worth his or her salt will know that you have to deliver a story and you have a way of uh, taking care of yourself. But the most important thing is not to do any harm to the, uh, to the, um, the survivor of FGM, to the vulnerable news source, 
you have to make sure that uh, these sources are covered, completely covered. But uh, on the other issue of, um, of strategies, getting new strategies, we know today that um, these things happen, but we're asking ourselves, how come very few people, we see very few people taken to court, okay? Cutters, these are people who have, this thing is happening, who is doing it? Why are people not going to court, okay? Then we are told these numbers, they are not going down. We know this thing is happening underground. Who is doing it? Why are we not, uh, are we doing so much? But uh, I'd like to ask uh, my colleagues, the journalists who are here, um, how far, are you okay? Are you comfortable that uh, the stories coming from the FGM, uh, that we are doing enough? Are we doing enough? You can answer, you can respond that in the chat. Do you think we are doing enough? And if we are not, uh, if you think we are doing enough, can you remember a story, a story that is striking that was done recently? I can remember one that was done by Gadi Chacha and he's here and it was fantastic story from, uh, from Korea. Do you remember such? So we ask ourselves, are we doing enough? And what can we do today so that um, we, we help in ensuring that uh, FGM, the practice is eradicated or reduced, reduced, reduced to the bare minimum. But well at it, because we know the people that we deal with are vulnerable. These are girls, say they are girls who have uh, refused the cut and they are in communities that are practicing. So you know, these are people who are also not uh, very safe. They are those ones who won't even to be involved in advocacy. But at times there's a limit to how far they can go. I would say that such people also uh, require um, their your sources, but at times they require the respect. They also require the security. So you must always be sensitive to know that in most cases you are dealing with, with vulnerable people so that uh, you know that you have no. to respect them. Jeremy, did you want to cut me short? <laughs> yes, I wanted to cut you short, but thank you very much. I think it's well covered. One thing that I would really want uh, maybe, and I think Naima would help us with this is, uh, we've had stories where we've had girls uh, and campaigners in general, I think, because uh, it's mostly coming from the community that uh, people are portrayed in a different way. And uh, I know that this, this do no harm principle um, where we try our best as well uh, from both the campaigners and journalists point of view to protect uh, the sources, as you say, so uh, from blurring their faces and how to tag and name them. So uh, Naima, if you would probably quickly give us a, a small, uh, overview of what that is as you go to the question and answer session and uh, just feel free to start lifting up your hands most of the questions are being answered uh, live as you continue so if you ask a question the panelists are typing the answers as you go on so Naima just a quick one on protecting the sources thank you very much can you see me and hear me yes great yeah. I'll be very I'll speak for really two minutes as there is already a toolkit as Jeremiah mentioned that really spells out everything that we do. I think from a, um, our perspective as a global media campaign consent is really important ensuring that um, the, the subject is protected and it's um, you know whether they're survivors whether they're reformed cutters whoever they are especially in, in knowing the FGM uh, in certain communities, particularly when it's like nearly 100% prevalent rate. And, uh, and uh, we have to be able to protect not just the journalists, but also the survivors, as well as, um, you know, the, you know, particularly survivors, I would say, who are living in those communities, ensuring that they're part of, from a filming perspective, for example, children under the age of 18, you need a consent from a, a guardian or a parent 
they need to be involved in any sort of interviews, ensuring that the blurring of, as you know, as Jeremiah mentioned, blurring of faces, distorting voices, ensuring that their identity is protected as, uh, as much as possible is really important. I think it's also understanding the aftermath. Okay, once the story has been published, what are the repercussions of it? Making sure that there's accuracy in the coverage of the story is also super important, which is why it's so important that journalists that care only cover stories and not just any random journalists that just want to cover an FGM story, cover it. Um, so as I said, these are just some a few things I wanted to touch on because like, I know we're running out of time. There's a toolkit with all of the um, say do no harm principles, how to uh, from a media perspective and, and it will be all shared with you after the session. Thanks a lot Naima. Um, so we just jump off and thank you very much Njeri. Uh, um, Judy, as well as Domitila, that was a really good session. Of course, we, we, we don't have enough time today to cover everything extensively, but um, we will have a WhatsApp group that are going to be joining after this session. We'll receive an email with an attachment of the link to join that WhatsApp group. Please um, click that link and you'll be able to join the WhatsApp group uh, once um, this recording is sent to you, as well as the link to join that WhatsApp group is. So we just go straight to the next uh, session. I know many people have already asked questions and you're already engaging with the uh, panelists. Please do so on the question and answer session if you want to do it one-on-one -on -one, or also lift your hands. Um, just uh, click the raise hand button with a little hand and you'll be able to have, um, we'll have a conversation. Please keep it very short. I'm going to allow you to speak um, and uh, we will begin with Shukri Abdi. Abdio, who uh, probably just gave us a very short um, question, basically, and address it to all the panelists, and they will be able to answer it. Please make it short and relevant. Shukri, you can now unmute and uh, begin talking. Okay, Shukri, um, sorry, I think I'll come back to you. Maggie, I see you raised up your hand. Uh, Maggie is the director, uh, executive director for GMC, and she's joined us. Maggie, if you're still there, I see you raised up your hand. On mute. All right. We, we can hear you, Maggie. I think we can hear you. Sorry, Jeremiah, I just missed that. Sorry, I just missed that question. I just popped to the loop. <laughs> All right, so I, I just, um, yeah, I, you raised up your hand and if you had a question, I just allowed you to speak. Um, no, sorry, I didn't have a question. I was just listening actually. And uh, I just find the the very interesting observations about, you know, being, being very um, smart as Domitilla said about trying to find new ways to engage journalists and new stories and um, to think about ideas that are personality based nobody wants to interview a CEO people want to interview people who have stories to tell mothers cutters survivors um, activists so I think there's, there's really good learning there for activists um, and I also think we, ha we have a WhatsApp group in every country, you know, where, where there's a lot of conversations going on about ideas. And I think journalists who are interested and committed, and that was another great point to make, we should be working with really committed journalists. Um, there's, it's a great source of stories to kind of, or ask for support or to try and get in contact with people to do interviews. So I think the WhatsApp groups are really important tool that could be used more. Thanks a lot, Maggie. Um, we'll just go uh, next to Mike. Uh, Mike, uh, sorry, can't see the full name, but Mike, I see you raised your hand. Kaguongo. You are unmuted. Go on, Mike. All right, so I'll go next to... Um, uh, Frank Lesekete. Thank you so much, Jeremiah. Uh, at least for now, we are in a good session. We are very, it is very interactive and being an activist, I count myself on the journey. Uh, I have one question, Moso, yeah. to 
Sorry. Go on, go on. Okay. The question goes like, um, since that we have a, we have challenges as activists, journalists, uh, and many of us are coming from very remote areas in the corners of this county. And more so to this, to some of us who are coming from very rigid cultures, we get some of us getting challenges, even threats from the hostile communities that we are living around being activists of FGM, because they sound that we are going against the cultures and norms, which are the best practices, which are the best situation, which are the best ways to address these issues so that they can understand what we are doing is really meant to assist them, not to attack the culture that they are defending. If I got you Thank right, you. if I got you right, Frank, um, and I, I, I would suggest to um, probably uh, delegate this to Njeri. Um, if I got you right, is how do we um, work with journalists as well? Because I think this is mostly journalists and, uh, and, and campaigners. How do we work together uh, to tackle um, hostility when we are doing these campaigns? Is that yeah. right, Frank? Yeah. Okay. Yes, very right. Perfect. Uh, that's uh, Jerry will answer that. I think let me just get someone else as we go on. Uh, Sadia, I see your hand is raised. Uh, keep raising your hands there and then I'll be able to pick it up. If you are able to text it, put it on the question and answer session and other panelists will respond as we go on. Sadia? Do I answer or do we wait for Sadia? Let's, let's first wait for the next question then just answer in a row very quickly. Yeah. Hello. We can hear you, Sadia. Okay. Um, I was just I just wanted to say something. Uh, yeah. We are losing you, Sadia. Can you hear us? Okay, we'll come back to you, Sadia. Uh, we'll get two more, and then uh, we will uh, get the answer, uh, the questions answered. Shukri Abdio. We can't hear you, Shukri. I think the connection is not very strong. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Shukri. Um, we will try and come back to you uh, again. Um, and call me. Okay, let's first get that question answered uh, by Jerry. Uh, please leave your questions on the uh, question and answer section. We'll also try to answer them as we go on uh, because we seem to have a lot of challenges with the connectivity. Uh, if you are ready, please drop a message on the comment section and uh, we will be able to let you speak to you, Jerry. Sorry. Okay, uh, thank you. Frank, uh, Frank um, are you from... Um... Are you in Samburu County or which county? Sorry for assuming. Frank. Okay, thank you so much. I'm coming from Samburu County, specifically Samburu West. Ah, okay. Yeah. I just yeah. uh, oh, I just wanted that for my own information. I, I, I know what you are talking about, but um I would like to to suggest or to advise like CSOs. Eh? The most important thing is um to get some other people you work with in the media and um, create like uh, Judy implied in her, her presentation to build a very concrete relationship. It, they may not be with all the journalists in Samburu, but with somebody with a, a few, like for instance, I know there's a, in Samburu, I know a journalist that I, who I have mentored is in Citizen TV, you know him, you know? you get close to a journalist 
so that uh, you can work uh, even when there are threats, even when you, you know that uh, there are certain threats that come your way, there's a way that, uh, that with somebody else, like a journalist, there are people they know they can talk to because they are journalists usually, okay, we can say they are, they are well connected within uh, like the administration, within that community. And when you're working together, I think um, this um, insecurity you feel kind of gets, uh, can I use the word lesson? So it is so important that uh, when, you are this, when you are doing this kind of work, you work uh, together as a, as a team. And I'll add that uh, I know, we know that a lot of CSOs who are doing fantastic work on the ground, but uh, for some reason, um, they don't really, people don't really get to, to know about what they are doing because um, they are either unable or to reach out to journalists, either within their counties or, or nationally, but uh, I can assure you that uh, when you get uh, to work with to know journalists and, and uh, just a few, you don't even have to know everyone and know them closely, you'll be able to deal with these kinds of uh, insecurity. I hope uh, I've been helpful, Frank. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks a lot, Jerry. I see Judy has raised her hand, her hand up. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Go on. Um, actually, um, I just wanted to emphasize on what Jerry has said. There's something we say spreading the risk. Um, for a journalist, sometimes you could be running uh, to do an exclusive or big story, but you realize if you do this story, you're going to be in total danger. And we've had incidences where journalists have been killed. We've had incidences where CSO um, members have been killed. So sometimes you think it's too dangerous, you can spread the risk. Spreading, uh, spreading the risk means uh, basically you don't like be the one always taking the thunder. You don't want to be like the one to be seen and bring this story because the common interest is to get the story out. The common interest is to get action, to have, you know, push or rescue the girls. So then as CSOs, Lata was saying sometimes the special incidences which requires us to come together. Even in journalism, we compete. We want to be the first to break the news. We want to be the journalist only with the exclusive story. But there are those incidences because of our safety, we got to come together for the sake of ensuring that girl is protected or this person, this perpetrator is put, uh, put behind bars. So always think of how can I spread the risk? Spreading the risk means that are there are CSOs that you can identify that you think you can resonate with, that you think you can have a common understanding with to talk about an issue because uh, an, uh, an enemy will, is, will run for you faster when you're alone. But when you are so many of you, they cannot be able to run after you. So this has also happened a lot of times to journalists. Whenever a journalist is asked, can you come to the DCI to record a statement? And then we say, we are coming, all of us. So when you are more of you, even the perpetrator or the person who wants to attack you, they are unable to run after you. So just learn how to spread the risk. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and I also think, this also helps the campaigners understand that journalists also have challenges covering these stories from their end. Um, so yeah, I'll go back to, uh, I see so many people are raising up their hands. Um, also the question and answer part is uh, flowing with questions. So I'd also I request the panelists to try address those ones uh, via text. Um, I see a couple of questions coming in, but I'll let someone speak. Um, so if you are able to speak now, as I see Anne Kome, are you there? If not, we'll have um, Elijah Karpa. If you are there. Not yet, okay, Christine Alphonse. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Christine. Thank you. Um, this is a very interesting discussion and um, something that has been always crossing my mind. 
mind is um, uh, sometimes as as uh, campaigners and activists, sometimes we actually call journalists. And this is to go to the journalists in the house. Uh, you find that you're calling a journalist for a, a story. For example, let me use the example that has just been used there, that uh, you're calling a journalist for a launch. But now for the journalist is like, that is not a story. You know, I want a, a juicy story, you see? But in your plan, you have also that survivor who is, a, 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 who, who, who is a, from child marriage and you're taking them back to school or uh, probably has, dropped out of school for several years and now it's going back to school. But you don't see that in your mind as a campaigner, we are like, ah, oh, it's it's it will be a story part of the launch, but later the journalist never comes. And then you're like, you're worried as a campaigner. What made this journalist not come? Because uh, a campaigner didn't know that was the reason, like the story is not juicy or it's not good. It, it doesn't have the captions that will interest people. So it's uh, there are those journalists who are very good, who have gone out of their way and like, Christine, I want you to make this story sweet or good and captivating. So this is what you need to do and this and this and this. Then you find that campaigners Oh no, we, we lost have you. Gone a long way to actually ensure then, but some some journalists actually ignore tell you it's not a good story to cover. Oh, sorry. So uh, actually, it's like a question to the journalist uh, or an urge to the journalist is, could you be able to engage the campaigner to actually understand what is that sweet part of the story that you want to come out, and then you like help us know or navigate around that story. That was my. Is it a comment or a question? Something like that. Mm. I think you're talking about, yeah, I think, I, and I think it's quite a relevant, and I don't know if it's an ethical one, but I think I'd, I'd um, give that to, um, who should I give that question to? Okay, any of the panelists can take up, uh, take that one up, but I know it's an, it's an issue to do with um, the angle and the relevance, yes. basically. Yeah. Can I take it up? And yes, please. Um, uh, Christine, is uh, that is a uh, is a uh, is an observation? Is a question that um, I'm sure most of uh, CSOs here would uh, want to ask, and that's why I'm saying that it is uh, Naima has actually said something important here that uh, it's not all journalists. It's not just any journalists who do certain stories as this uh, FGM. There are those who are very passionate about about these stories. One thing I would still uh, not tire in advising you to reach out to journalists. If you find that uh, maybe the journalist who is your in your county or the journalist that uh, you, you refer to, you find that all the time you keep talking to them and they are not interested in these stories, you could do this because um, I'm sure you read news, you listen uh, to stories, you. For instance, I assume that uh, um, in, your, in, in your county, say you are in Narok. So the Narok uh, nation, I think, and standard, uh, their offices, uh, their main, the bureau is based uh, is in Akuru. So you can take an interest, find out uh, the structures of, uh, of, of um, that particular media house. If uh, you know that is a nation Nakuru, it's not uh, difficult to find out who is the editor in Nakuru. You find that there's a lady there called Stella. Just reach out and don't never fear to reach out and say there's this and that. But journalists who are here now, and and some who find uh, stories say of FGM, you think they are tired. I don't think they are tired. Now you should know that. Uh, Given that there are so many angles of stories that uh, we can, you can get, even as you work with CSOs. For instance, the target, the Kenya deadline for eradicating this uh, practice is 2022. So there are so there could you can get stories around around that, and you work uh, with CSOs. So you don't have to use what uh, quote and quote that uh, you call tired. So Christian also. Don't, uh, don't be afraid, just reach out. You can reach out, you can even call in Nairobi. 
I can tell you can even call me. You can look for even journalists. Like for instance, I am a journalist. At times, uh, Wednesdays, at least twice a month, I write a column on gender. My email is there. You can even email me, say, oh, I am in this place. I'd like to do this and this. You seek advice. So there's nothing wrong in reaching out and always uh, make sure that you do that. Okay. Thanks a lot, Nigeria. I think uh, we are almost running completely out of time. Sadia, you requested to uh, try again. Um, and I hope everyone's questions have been answered so far. Sorry, we are taking it fast because uh, I know it's getting quite late. Uh, very yeah, briefly, thank Sadia. Thank you, thank you, thank you uh, Jeremy. Uh, sorry, sorry, you know, I, I, I'm just from Kajiado, you know, Jeremy, and uh, yeah, so my laptop fell down and I was getting out of the car and uh, that's how sorry. I missed the whole opportunity, I'm sorry. But this sorry. is a very great uh, in forum that we really need to share what works well, the best practices and all that. So number one, I was saying I agree with Domtila, especially now with the COVID, the media was the only savior because of the lockdown, public gatherings were banned, you know, even uh, the number of people we used to reach were reduced, you know, because of the COVID issues and all that. We have to follow a lot of protocols, you know, but with media, it's always powerful and magic. And this is why I always say like uh, media is really powerful you know why because you know even now with an outreach the number of people we can reach is actually maximum of 100 but when you go to one local radio station then you are bound to reach to um, even more than ten thousands of people so we really need to do three things number one i agree with naima that we do not harm the survivors we really need to make sure that we seek their consent and we do not further expose them. Why am I saying this? Because it is the daughters of these survivors who are again going through FGM. It's something that they are doing to their daughters. So if we get a survivor who is really uh, ready to convert, then we should never further expose them to uh, stigma. And uh, I'm saying this as a survivor as well. And I know media has really worked for me. And I know my story has really changed a lot of people. So now I'm imagining if we can have hundreds of Saadias sharing their stories as survivors, I'm very sure um, we'll really convince a lot of people within the community that we really need to change and abandon this practice. But if we continue stigmatizing the survivors, then we really continue to talk about FGM, but the real survivors will continue suffering, hiding in silence. And we are very sure that when we give them media as a platform, as a safe space that they can share their stories and we guarantee them that there is no harm that will befall them. I'm certain enough this, that these survivors will really become a change maker. And again, uh, with the religious leaders, you know, for me, I always say it's not about using the media, just using the media. It's about being creative. It's about using the right content when we are going to, to the media. For instance, you go to a local radio station, whatever you are going to say will determine how the community will change their minds and all that. It's not about just securing airtime and all that. So I really want to thank Global Media Campaign and UNFPA for trusting grassroots activists. Actually, no one has ever trusted grassroots activists. But with the GMC, we have been able to go to media anywhere. Sometimes you are given a free airtime in Nairobi. You are told to come to NTV for a talk show. You are told to go to a radio, for example, in Nairobi. How will I come all the way from Tanariva, all the way from West Pokot? For, for Domtila or Saadia to come to a TV or radio, you need transport. And that's what GMC has really supported us. Sometimes even the free platforms need some other expenses that really global media has saved us. And we really want to appeal again that you continue supporting grassroots activists, especially those who are trying to become media campaigners. And to the journalists, I want to appeal to you all. FGM is not a topic that is always prioritized, but today I want to challenge you. 
now imagine if the scars were visible on the face. So back to you, Jeremy. Thank you so much for the opportunity. As a survivor, I really want to appreciate the media and we really need to abandon FGM because I do not wish any other girl to, to go through what I experienced. It should end with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sadia. I see uh, Judy had something to say as we wrap up. I'll then uh, welcome Maggie and Aicha uh, as well as Naima to close yeah. Mustafa as well. Uh, yeah, but to you, Judy. Um, my assignment to the CSOs today, um, it, do you have a media list? The media list that you have, the journalists that you have there, do you know them? Do you know the kind of stories that they write? Do you think that they're journalists that you can rely on? If you don't have, please go and develop a list of around 10 journalists, look at their work, what they do, and see whether these are the kind of journalists you'd want to work with. Secondly, have you looked at how you pitch your press releases, your press uh, invitations, or do you start with, today we are launching, we are tired of launching things. So can you start with something that is exciting, something that is striking and attractive? Because we realized we have said perpetrators have changed their way of doing things. So we too have to change the way we are doing the things. And for the journalists, are you comfortable with the he says, she says stories? As an award-winning journalist, I'll tell you, the he says, she says stories will never get you anywhere, will never progress in your career. The good stories that will make you progress in your career, that will make you feel that you are a journalist because you are changing something in the society, are the stories that they're talking about, the grassroots, the people who need us, the voices that do not have the capacity to come to town and talk or hold a press conference. Those are the stories that will not only build your career, but will as well be contributing to the society. That is just my final advice for now, but it has been an exciting session. Thanks a lot, Judy. We just bring this to a close. Um, I won't say much. I'll just um, invite Aicha um, to speak on behalf of, uh, of JHR um, as you bring this to a close. Mustafa as well, if you have something to add on as we bring this to a close. But just to say thank you very much for anyone and everyone who has contributed to us this session. I'll just, have, uh, I'll just guide you from, uh, um, I'm just going to guide you on how you're going to access the WhatsApp link for the groups that, that you're going to be joining. But yeah, welcome. Okay, well, we'd like to thank Pitch. Pitch Dark, where I am right now. Well, it's been, a, it's been a great, great evening, I would say. It's been very fantastic sessions from um, looking at the legal frameworks, which um, Winnie Sumbua took the time to take us through from both the domestic and international legal frameworks that regulate um, the practice of FGM in. In, in Kenya, and the bottom line on um, that one is FGM is a violation of human rights, it's a gross violation of human rights, and also bottom line is also FGM is criminal and it is outlawed in Kenya. Now what I want to talk about now is the next steps of what we are doing. This this session, this webinar that we've had this evening is just one of several other engagements that we wish to continue to have with both journalists and CSOs. And what we, what we wish to do with this is to create a link, is to create, is to bridge the divide. And we've already had, you know, a bit of distrust between CSOs, you know, between um, campaigners from the grassroots level and the media. And we've also heard about the access challenges that campaigners often you know, get. It's difficult for them to have access to conventional mainstream media. This is one key issue we wish to address with this um, collaboration between Journalists for Human Rights and a global media campaign to end FGM. And how would we do this. One thing that we've already agreed that we're going to do going forward is to have a WhatsApp uh, platform which will have both um, the journalists and the campaigners. And this is a platform where you could share information, where you could share tips, where you could work together. But 
going forward, and other thing that we wish to do be in this collaboration is also to launch a story, um, a call for interest for story grants, in which we'll bring in both, you know, in which journalists will apply to, you know, with a pitch, will pitch stories, um, you know, that are stories that have to do with FGM in all these hotspots, um, FGM communities across Kenya, and journalists for human rights will work with these journalists, will fund, will provide, you know, funding to support the journalists to do the stories. So this will happen, you know, immediate, you know, in a week after now. We will, you know, by next week, we'll announce, you know, we'll make a call and we'll encourage you to pitch stories that have to do with FGM. But what stories are we interested in more at this point? We are keen to receive pitches that are particularly focusing on the accountability element in the fight to end FGM. Yes, there are laws in Kenya that criminalizes, that outlaw female genital mutilation. Yes, the president publicly has made a commitment, has made a declaration to end FGM by next year, which is very soon. But then again, how does you know how does all of you know this translate in the community? You know, are the laws working? Are people aware about these laws? Are local are local authorities, you know, are authorities in local communities taking these prohibitions seriously? So when you're thinking about stories, because this is where we want to get, we want to get to the accountability aspect of it. Where do we go next? Who is violating this? Who is violating these these laws and these policies? So it's been a pleasure to be here with you all this evening, and I'm glad you all made the time to join the session this evening. And you know, thank you to the Global Media Campaign and uh, the FGM. It, it's you know, it's been great, and I'm personally and the rest of on behalf of the rest of the Journalists for Human Rights team, looking forward to working with you more in the fight to end FGM. It's possible, we can do it with, you know, um, commit, with commit, commitment and persistence. I thank you all and uh, looking forward to working with you. And, um, you know, we will soon share a call. We will soon share a call with you regarding the story grants and we're happy to receive your pitches and we're happy to provide, you know, a bit of funding for us to provide funding for your stories to be produced as well as um, mentor those stories and those mentorship will happen between the global media campaign and journalists for human rights asante sana thank you all thanks a lot mustafa uh, for your closing remarks um i just give it to naima Thank you, Jeremiah. I echo everything Mustafa just said. Uh, this was a really great session and thank you all for your time and, and being with us this evening. Or oh, the only other thing that I would like to add uh, to what Mustafa said is we as the Global Media Campaign um, do have small grants too that we offer campaigners as well as journalists. We call it direct action grants uh, and, uh, and they are bi-monthly grants that again to amplify those sort of stories from the grassroots. Uh, so just to put things in perspective, for instance, we've recently supported initiatives that will be upcoming next week for the day of the African child. This is a really good opportunity, for instance, to for those that are pitching stories to think about uh, FGM stories uh, for the day of the African child, uh, when it comes to accountability of government, when it comes to really protecting our, Afri our African children, what other futures we envisage for them. There's so many content that could be created around that. So this, just to kind of focus the mind, that would be a really good opportunity for those journalists that want to pitch stories to um, journalists, uh, journalists for human rights. So on that note, thank you very much for everybody. Thank you very much, uh, JHR, for this opportunity and the this collaboration i'm sure this will be one of many and this this these sorts of sessions will be more hope we envisage that there will be more sessions like this and other sort of initiatives that we will partner with in the future so thank you very much asante sana everyone thank you thanks a lot naima okay so we bring this to a close
Um, I know we have Maggie here who's very passionate about the end of GM campaign. Maggie, I see your hand is raised up um, in case you want to speak. And also Aicha, if you are around and you'd like to speak, uh, you can still uh, have a, um, a quick, um, yeah, you, yeah, you can just uh, turn on your microphone and uh, say something as we bring this to a close. Yeah, this, this will take about 20 seconds. <laughs> I just want to say it's been amazing listening to everybody talking together. And uh, just to, to add that, um, as Domatilla said and, and Sadia, since we've been, we've been working since 2014 and building a WhatsApp group of journalists and activists together. So um, let's keep building on that and all the information about the GMC grants and the Journalists for Human Rights grants and everything can be there so we can create a really supportive community for activists and for journalists and also a source of great stories. So um, I just want to let everybody know that that WhatsApp group exists and maybe contact Dom Tilla um, if you're interested in joining it. All right, thanks a lot, Maggie. I will also be sending a link to everyone on their email everyone that has joined this conversation, then they'll be able to join um, the WhatsApp group with journalists and campaigners. So I think that would be covered. So please make sure that you open your emails after um, latest tomorrow at 10 a.m. Yeah. Aicha, are you there? Okay. All right. So we I think we have to say goodbye for today. Thank you very much for joining. It's been a pleasure. Uh, Jerry, uh, Judy, Mustafa, Ijamagi, Domitila, uh, Naima. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, Winnie uh, and everyone who's spoken today. We do appreciate having you here today. And this is, as we said earlier, it's, it's one among many. So let's keep tuning in. We'll be back once again. We'll let you know. Please join that WhatsApp group. Invite. Uh, journalists who wanted to join today but were not able to, and people who are passionate about covering such stories. Remember that we have these opportunities as well for funding. Uh, campaigners uh, uh, can apply for media grants uh, when uh, when when um, rounds of action, direct action grants are announced, applications, as well as uh, journalists who can apply via JHR. So let's keep this uh, going via the WhatsApp group, and uh, I'm sure we'll be able to accelerate the ending of FGM. Asante sana and kwaheri, see you soon.